Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last chapter, Chapter 14, The Realm of Life. Life, the most complicated things in the universe. Uh, I think you'll find this chapter interesting. We're only going to um, read the first 20 or so pages because I think the last section is something that's covered <clears throat> in more traditional biology courses. I think you guys have heard that story quite a bit. So before we get to the overview of the chapter, let's... Um, Let's talk about a couple course notes. Okay, chapter 14 is our last chapter. Please read from page 529 to the middle of page 548. The final, as we mentioned a number of times, is canceled. The last assessment for the course is paper number two. Please refer to our Blackboard site for details of paper two in assignment descriptions. The finished paper should be emailed to me, Dr. Mailer, by midnight, December 15th. Um, also, I'd like to invite everyone in our course to please consider joining us on December 8th for a light dinner from 5 to 6.30. At the dinner, you'll have a chance to see and use scientific instruments from the 19th century. We'll have microscopes, scales, and a spectroscope from the 19th century. We'll also have some 19th century famous books uh, on science. For example, we have um, uh, a second edition, uh, Darwin on Origin of Species. We have Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace's book uh, called Darwinism. I think you guys will find them interesting. We have a couple other books on science that were written back in the uh, late 19th century. Okay, let's take a look. As, um, as John Gribben says, uh, we are the most complicated because we are middle sized And he takes the first few pages of the chapters to explain that. Um, I also found this um, website called Chronozoom that I think you guys, uh, if you have the time, take a look at it. It's in beta right now, but it's a really a fascinating way to get perspective on life and time of our universe. Um, when you get there, just click the introductory tour if you have an interest. Now, the, one of the first things that we want to talk about is the development of the cell theory. Um, as microscopes got better and better, we'll mention this again, uh, people like Matthias Schleiden, who studied plants, uh, starts coming up with uh, a part of the cell theory that says all plants are made of cells. Dr. Theodor Schwann uh, worked with animals, and he starts saying the same thing. And cell theory is really profound. It, it seems simple, but it's a very profound thing. It says all living organisms are composed of one or more cells. The cell is the most basic unit of life, and all cells arrive, arise from pre-existing cells. And the chapter talks about this and why it's so important. One of the things that Darwin got wrong was Darwin, when he started thinking about how, does, how do cells transfer information from one cell to the other as new organisms arise, I mean, as parents give rise to uh, children, how, how does that happen? And one of the things he thought was that there was something called gemmules, um, and that gemmules were in, uh, there was information in all of our cells, and somehow that information was literally transmitted to only the uh, reproductive cells. And uh, as this little cartoon says, okay, so I was wrong about the pangenesis thing. Pangenesis was the, um, was the overall theory that gemmules was attached to. Now, as I mentioned earlier, microscopes improved dramatically in the 19th century. Um, they had vast improvements in design, function, objectives, and condensers were being built. Multiple lenses had increasing degrees of optical correction. Um, not only was it difficult uh, in the early days of the microscope to make lenses, but lenses had what was called chromatic aberration, which means uh, they were really not adjusted for colors and different uh, wavelengths of color. Uh, were not corrected for, and so what happened was when you were looking at something in the microscope, you see all this haze of color around them. It made uh, getting details from what you were looking at difficult. Photomicrography uh, <clears throat> made its debut in the mid-century, and by the end of the 19th century, high-end microscopes perform much better than even the student microscopes that are produced today. This is an example to the right. This is an example of one of those microscopes. This is a Bausch & Lomb Continental from about 1899 or 1901. We'll see one similar to that on December 8th if you'd like to come in and take a look at that. Um, this gentleman made one of the most dis important discoveries of, um, of the century, of uh, the early century. His name is Fleming. Walter Fleming, and he discovered chromosomes that cells divide and that they, when they divide, a 
structure within cells called chromosomes seem to be very, very important. And of course, you've heard about the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. Um, I, I put these two pictures in. One is the traditional picture you see of Mendel on the left. And the other is, we now we have a scientist, one of the first pictures I've ever found of a scientist almost smiling because in the 19th century, photography was seen as very serious and you were always not supposed to be smiling. But here's an actual shot of Gregor Mendel um, almost smiling um, in this picture. Of course, Mendel worked with pea plants and he discovered that there were traits like uh, plump versus wrinkled, green versus yellow, that pea, pl pan pea, excuse me, pea plants were able to transmit from generation to generation. And it was really the fact that he discovered that these traits could be lumped into dominant traits and recessive traits that really started the ball rolling as far as how genetics worked. Darwin and many others in the 19th century had the mechanism wrong just because they didn't have the technology, nor did they have the experimental evidence to suggest. Now, even though today there are Mendelian laws of genetics, we now know that not all heredity uh, works on Mendelian laws. Um, but the cell giving rise to DNA, the end of the reading talks about how they were very, very close to discovering DNA. And that's really what cracked in the middle 20th century with Watson and Crick, cracked open the key to life. Uh, science in the 21st century. Um, many people who write about science and the history of science say that the 20th century was the age of physics. All the incredible discoveries, uh, human beings learned how to fly, the atomic bomb, radio, television, uh, the car, uh, so many things uh, in the uh, 20th century were related to physics. And uh, those who write about it say that the 21st century will be the age of life, the age of biology, and it will be a really interesting time for all of us. First of all, uh, at the end of this overview, I'd like to thank everybody for taking our History of Science course. Just remember a few notes. Make sure that uh, your paper number two is emailed to me by midnight, December 15th. Please join us for that light dinner and talk and display of the 19th century scientific instruments in uh, room 665 at Gladfelter on Tuesday, December 8th. That's our first study day. And if you're planning on attending, would you please shoot me an email so that I can have uh, approximately the correct amount of food? Well, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please email me. And this is our last chapter overview. So we read the first eight chapters in the first half of the course and six chapters up to mid-chapter 14 uh, for the second half of the course. Hope you guys have your semester ends well and that you have a good break. And I will see you soon.